Hi, I'm Louis Evans. I've been uh, teaching physics for about 17 years. You can find me on Twitter uh, at Mr. Louis Evans. And um, if I ever get around to writing more than one blog post, you can read them on the quantumclassroom.wordpress.com. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the benefits of keeping it simple. And there may be some things which you've heard before or figured out um, for yourself, but I'm hoping there's going to be some valuable takeaways for everyone, particularly teachers who are earlier in their careers. And don't forget to please join the conversation on Twitter during the Chat Physics Live conference. So in the famous words of uh, Avril Lavigne, why do you have to go and make things so complicated? Um, I honestly think as a profession, we overcomplicate teaching. Um, and this is particularly true for the expectation on early career teachers. At a time where they need to be focusing on core aspects of their practice, they're expected to do a myriad of things which experienced teachers are able to do uh, by virtue of their experience. So I'm going to cover three um, aspects of teaching that teachers and particularly physics teachers could do with simplifying. Uh, so that is their explanations, their lesson structure and um, analogies and, and models that they use. So first off, um, explanations. Um, so in my view, teachers are often caught between a rock and a hard place in terms of um, explanations. On one hand, you've got those uh, teachers whose subject knowledge just isn't quite good enough. And if I'm being honest, that was me um, early on in, in my career. And on the other hand, you've got teachers um, you know, who have the curse of knowledge. Um, they understand stuff so well uh, that they can find it really difficult to craft an explanation for novices. Um, so in terms of lack of subject knowledge, I mean, this, as I said, was definitely me early on in, uh, in my career. You know, I had three very chastening experiences very early on that highlighted for me how important it was that to um, get my subject knowledge up uh, to um, a, a much higher level, really, than, than it was. Uh, even, you know, for, for the first one, my interview at King's, um, I was asked to explain how an X-ray scan worked, and uh, I essentially kind of explained how ultrasound scans work, but with X-rays, which which was uh, really bizarre. Um, and thankfully, actually, on the course, um, um, they did give us an opportunity to um, develop our craft of, of, of giving explanations um, and uh, my my chosen one or, or assigned one was to do with explaining tides and I realized that something which you know I understood how it worked but actually um, crafting an explanation that was very clear and concise uh, was, was something which early on I realized wow this is this is actually maybe a little bit harder um, harder than I thought um, and in terms of kind of that lack of subject knowledge, I remember my first placement, I I made such a mess of, of um, a lesson uh, that I delivered on, on forces and, you know, classic kind of interaction pairs and um, kind of like errors, really, um, which just highlight for me, you know, that I have to, I had to kind of like improve my subject knowledge, you know, it, it wasn't enough to have, you know, you, your good A level grades, it wasn't enough to have your degree, your subject knowledge needs to be kind of a lot better really than uh, than you might expect. You, know, you can get through your A levels, you can get through your degree with with kind of like loads of um, loads of things that need to be sorted that, that aren't quite good enough. Um, and then on the other hand, those teachers who um, have this curse of knowledge of you know their knowledge is actually kind of like really really outstanding already um but what can happen then is that um i, I guess it's a bit of hubris really you, you know you, you can um turn up to your lesson and you can just waffle on a topic um and you can add in lots and lots of details that aren't really necessary to get your point across and and they can be really interesting details and particularly interesting to you you know the person who's um who's sharing them but um you're just essentially piling on excessive information onto your students, um, which which they probably at that point don't need. Um, and what can happen when you do begin to waffle on then, it's very, very easy to misspeak. Uh, you may feel uh, that your main point 
has been kind of put across. Um, but there's this kind of risk that students will latch on to something minor that you've said, which which could cause them issues. And you don't really see it. Um, you know, I, I kind of like think that it's comparable to having like an expert bike rider and a novice bike rider uh, going down kind of like a very bumpy path. Like an expert bike rider, you know, can handle that because they've, they've got the skills and the experience necessary to stay on the bike. But for, for a novice, that could be really difficult. And, and um, you know, unless we're aware of being very careful of the words that we're saying that then those um those problems can arise um and one thing which i find which you know i definitely think is part of the craft of uh, teaching that you know we all probably often do this is um the idea that when you are um in the middle of an explanation and you might just paraphrase like in, in a moment um you've suddenly kind of had that light light bulb um feeling and, and you kind of um have just thought of some amazing additional way to explain something because all you've got is a sea of blank faces. You know, what you're saying isn't cutting through. So you kind of, oh, right, hang on, let me try it like this um, instead. Um, and I get, I know that's part of the craft of teaching, but, um, you know, if, if you're just doing something off the cuff like that, you might really end up kind of like causing more issues um, than expected. Um, so, we're going to talk about now the the solution my view of the solutions for for getting explanations right um so the idea in my view with exp explanations is that you want to simplify them um so the first thing is to copyright your explanations or at least the kind of the the, the core part of them um, now copywriters are experts at refining text they cut out the superfluous to enable key points to be put across and i think the same things actually need to happen to explanations um i would be particularly mindful of adjusting your explanations based on the key stage you're working with and obviously that kind of seems obvious but um if you are maybe like teaching a key stage four and a key stage three class a similar topic at the same time it's very very easy to um with your younger students suddenly kind of like just go through the kind of motions of how you've explained something to to an older class um and that you know that that can be problematic because they just haven't got the um the kind of background knowledge and the and the kind of experience really maybe to understand um something at, at that kind of like higher level um so copywriters uh, you know one of the good things that they do is that they adjust their text to their audience uh, so they think about who their target audience is and um we need to be very careful of that as well next up i would definitely suggest practice your explanations um use a script um it, and it doesn't have to be your whole lesson and, and i actually would say that's excessive and inflexible to script out a whole lesson in my view uh, but for the core concept that you're trying to um teach definitely write up a short script, you know, run it by a department. Does it cover everything essential? Can it be stripped back at all? Can you take out anything um, unnecessary? You have options for great CPD within your school, go and watch some experts. And, and this could be your colleagues. Um, it, and it doesn't have to be for a whole lesson. Uh, maybe you know that someone is teaching a particular topic. Um, and in that lesson, they're going to explain something, go in, watch them just for that um, five, 10 minutes um are you able to pick up on how how they are um crafting their explanations and making them really clear and concise um we've obviously got now as well fantastic youtubers out there explaining concepts um you know you've got lewis matheson um on a level and gcse physics online you know watch some of those videos i think uh science communication is, is a you know a really big skill and the people who are doing this professionally have developed that um developed that craft so definitely go ahead and watch them um so your peers youtube read up um when i kind of like did my teacher training i remember you know a really helpful book which was from the ase it was uh, teaching secondary physics and it had a lot of great ideas about kind of like how to deal with misconceptions and um also on kind of like activities and stuff and to use, but some of the newer books out there now, like uh, Cracking Key Concepts, um, are much kind of like better actually just having sort of like a, a, a scripted explanation for you to follow. So do have a read 
of some new books to um, uh, to find those those types of um, script explanations, which you can just literally just try and use or adapt as suitable for for your own class. I would definitely suggest um, reading up on some blogs or um, chat physics articles as well. Um, you know, I'd also encourage you maybe as part of your process of scripting your explanations to write your own blogs or, or um, articles. And I actually think they're some of my favorite things to read um, online are just simple things where teachers say, this is how I teach topic X. And, and when, particularly when they include how they explain something, I, I think that's um, excellent CPD. Next up, analogies. Now, we as physics teachers, we love analogies. Um, you know, we, they're, they're used all over the, all over the place, and uh, that's particularly um, important in physics because you know we're, we're working with a lot of abstract concepts. You know, going from the scale of atoms to the scale of the universe. You know, the unseen and the unobservable is everywhere. So we've got no choice. We have to use um, we have to use analogies. But um, if we are going to use analogies, I think we should first up consider, um, is it really needed? Okay, I think often they are unnecessary. Um, that it might be something fun or interesting that we think, but is it is it adding anything? So think about whether your um, analogies or models are unnecessary. You know, I remember one lesson where, you know, I got students to make like a human bar chart and they were like lying on the floor um, being the axes and the bars. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure whether my students kind of like learned uh, anything about graphs uh, from that, but they were understandably annoyed about being made to, uh, made to lie on the floor. Um, and I don't know, you could argue maybe, you know, something to do with embodied cognition, but it, I, th I think it was actually completely unnecessary. I didn't need to, to kind of model that way or use kind of like people as some sort of um, analogy for graphs. And, and so it, it should just get in the bin. Um, I think you need to consider where, whether your um, analogy is going to add unnecessary complexity or rely on understanding of a separate domain of physics. And I think, you know, a great example of this is the, um, if you do use it, the ski lift model for circuits, the idea of um, increasing, you know, potential as the, as the uh, skiers go up the lifts. And it's a, it's a great one for potential difference. But when I've kind of looked at the schemes of work for um, at some schools where they use this, um, it's often coming before they, they've done much work on energy. So it, it, you need to really consider whether uh, the analogy for you that seems like, oh, it makes a lot of sense. Is it going to make sense for your students? And then also consider whether your analogy um, just has too many caveats. Is, is, is it overly complex? Uh, you know, one of the ones, you know, that I'm not a big fan of is the rope model for current in circuits, if you know it. Um, and, you know, trying to consider, oh, is the rope the wire? No, it, it's the charges, you know, and where is the wire then? Or oh, it's, not, it's, it's not really there. And oh, it's, maybe it's the hands, uh, but they aren't in every place but they're also the components. And, and I just think there's there's too much going on. And, you know, I'll hold my hand up and say that I used to use uh, a bread van model. And I spent so long um, ensuring that students knew what each part of the model represented that, you know, we, we could have just been getting on with things and, and learning about circuits. And, and it was, I, I just felt that whenever I had conversations with students following on from using the bread van model, it was always like, well, the bread does the, the bread van does this, and, and and the bakery does this, and it it was just it was ridiculous. It was it was just um, distracting, really, from um, the physics that I wanted them to learn. So, the solution, I think, first up, we need to ask ourselves: um, Is it really needed? And be honest. If it isn't, just bin it. Um, if an analogy requires any prerequisite knowledge, then make sure that a it, it's been taught. Uh, B, that it's understood. So you may need, you know, to, to check that at the start of your lesson. Uh, and if an analogy is um, distracting from the core kind of like physics that you're that you're trying to teach, then I, I would just say get rid of it. it. It might be one of your favorites. It might be one you really enjoy using. But, um, you know, be critical and um, get rid of it if, if, if it's not suitable. So a couple of good examples that um, I like. Uh, the first one is by Gethin Jones, the Coulomb train model. 
Um, and the reason why I think this is a good example of an analogy or model to use is that all of the objects are named with the same terminology as, as the kind of the things which we're trying to explain. So we have, you know, charges, we have energy. Uh, we don't need to kind of like do any sort of like substitution of this is this part, this is this part. Um, and I think that um, that really makes it easier to access. And you can read all about that on the physics teacher blog. Um, the other one is this one, which is uh, a model for alpha particle scattering. And you can see David here kind of happily modeling it. Um, I think this type of model is great because even though we, we do have different parts which are representing something within the alpha particle scattering experiment, you can literally just name each of these things um, as you use them. So, you know, rather than saying, oh, here I've got a Nerf gun, here I've got an alpha source. You know, here I have a gold atom, here I have a gold nucleus. And you can very easily just name each part as it is, and, and that um, makes it much simpler for the students to be able to, um, to access it. Okay, and then finally, um, lesson structures, and I would say particularly kind of observed lesson structures. And I, and I, you know, I don't want to assume that things have moved on in every school across the country. This may be something that's been relegated to the history books at your school, um, in, in which case, great news. So in my view, the, the problem with lesson structures, and particularly observed lesson structures, is that um, they're often just unrealistic. Um, you know, we've got... Um, perhaps like a very complex kind of observation framework. Um, and you're, you're literally just playing a game for observations uh, and learning walks, um, you know, hours on lessons plans, um, you know, huge workload implications. Normal teaching is not um, always like this unless you are maybe reteaching a previous observation. And I think the, the group of teachers which are particularly kind of damaged by this are early career teachers. You know, they're, they're observed often, and they're at a stage in their career where they need to focus on developing certain skills like behavior management, and it can be really draining for them to have to produce these overplanned lessons on mass. So I kind of like think about the, the kind of certain eras that I went through in teaching. And, you know, the, the first one was the idea of um, this sort of putting on a show uh, in, in lessons. And it, and it really just wasn't, um, it wasn't normal at all um, compared to, you know, everyday teaching. Um, I think, you know, these lessons had to have some sort of like je ne sais quoi. You, you, you couldn't kind of like even um, really kind of like point out exactly what it was for an outstanding. They just needed to have some sort of like ineffable quality that you could sense during the lesson. And, and what that normally meant was a huge amount of, of planning time and, uh, to, to get all the resources and stuff necessary uh, for these kinds of um, lessons. Uh, you know, they often needed some spectacular hook to generate interest in 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 the subject that it was just completely over the top it, it was it was entertainment first rather uh rather than teaching and you know even now i'd say you're probably more distracted by hugh jackman uh than, than any point um that i'm making I, I kind of feel that's you know a, a very good analog for for what those kind of lessons um were like uh and you may be somewhere or may have been somewhere where you felt like your lessons, you were just like a progress monitor um, where all you had to do was prove throughout the lesson that progress was um, was being made. And, and then the first step of that was to take a data point rather than assuming, you know, your progress and time graph goes to the origin. So you'd have to prove that students didn't know something. And then your whole lesson would be built around regular mini plenaries um, constantly, um, you know, proving where they are on this on this um progress kind of progression um and it didn't didn't give you much time for teaching it, it, it just took away from the teaching time and then finally you need um some way to prove at the end like indisputable proof that all of your students have made significant um progress so you know you'd only teach something if it was new to the students and it was achievable by all of them just within a um, within a single observed um, lesson. And that meant that, you know, the whole focus was all around this short term kind of progress. There was there was no kind of like looking at um, what the long term progress was. Are the students going to know this, uh, you know, a week later or um, two weeks later? 
Um, so the solution, in my view, is to simplify your lesson structure. Um, start off with some kind of retrieval, um, particularly on concepts that are foundational for the lesson you're going to teach. Um, and then obviously be mindful of, of considering reteaching if needed. Um, explain whatever you're going to explain. Model uh, how to how to go through a certain process, perhaps. Check that the students understand. Give them the opportunity for independent practice, which gives you lots of time then to circuit and work with those you've identified who may need help. And then and then finally, kind of like have some kind of um, some kind of review. And throughout all of this, just lots and lots of um, questioning. Um, and thankfully, now this idea of a kind of like a, a very standardized or simple kind of like structure is, is, I think, kind of like happening in lots of schools, which I'm glad for, you know, you know, articles like Rosenshine's um, Principles for Instruction or books like Making Every Science Lesson Count, I think, um, have really kind of like hammered at home in recent years, which, which, which is great. Um, now, you know, many years ago, I probably wouldn't have taught like this uh, during observe lessons, you know, because of the, you know, the fear of being boring. But, um, you know, I'm, I really am hoping that we, we've moved on. I know I have. Um, so in terms of further reading, uh, I've not read um, these two books, but I know that, that they talk about kind of lots, lots of aspects of um, sim simplicity in teaching. So Teach Like Nobody's Watching by Mark Enser and Simplicity Rules by Joe Facer, if you want to read more about um, just stripping back your teaching and, and making it, um, you know, simple and effective. And just then to, to finish, just to kind of like challenge you really, to, to aim to keep it simple, you know, next week when you're back in class, um, take a look at some of your explanations. Is there any way that you can cut them back and make them really simple and straightforward and more powerful for your students? Um, if you are going to use an analogy in, in the kind of like short term, um, just think, is it necessary? It might be a bit of a wrench to kind of to bin it, uh, but uh, it might be the best choice for your students. And then next time you have perhaps like an observation or a learning walk, maybe don't be tempted to be the show person, you know, just give it the usual teaching, even if, you know, in your heart, you kind of, oh, this feels boring. Trust me, uh, that consistently good uh, teaching, even if it may be a bit boring, is, is definitely um outstanding and if, if your school doesn't want that maybe it's not the right school for you um and then to, i'll just leave you with the words of my physics teacher dad uh which he always, always used to tell me is just give it a kiss keep it simple stupid thanks very much